Hello, everyone, and welcome to one more webinar. I know I look as a bandido, but uh, <laughs> it's not exactly the right focus. But anyway, I'm joking. Uh, it's, it's really me, and uh, here I am. Good to see you, everyone, and welcome to another home gemology webinar. And uh, actually, it, we are on time. Usually, I invite Edward for stuffing sausages the Portuguese expression for encher chouriço, which is basically small talk to fill uh, gaps in, uh, in media. Oh, hello, Edward. What a nice, uh, how do you say that in English? Cover, mask, cover. mask, face mask. Mine is so much prettier than yours. I mean, you might have coral, but I have Liberty print on mine. <laughs> Jeremy's got a nice one too. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jeremy Shefford. Welcome. If also, I had known we didn't have to brush our teeth today, Rui. I wouldn't have. <laughs> You've got the most dignifying uh, mask on the on the team. So, hello, Edward. Uh, hello, Jeremy. Rui, it's good to see you. Good morning. Good afternoon here. Good afternoon to you, Rui. Nice to see you again. Welcome to you, Jeremy. Let's get going again. And uh, what, what time is it in LA, Jeremy, by the way? It is 6.01 a.m., a little early oh, still. Very yeah, good. I know, I'm here for you, Rui. Are you still awake or you just woke up early? How do you know if I've even gone to bed yet? <laughs> so welcome, I'm really happy to have you here, um, and Jeremy. It's a really a privilege to have one of the persons that inspired me to do my digital transformation like three years ago. And uh, this is true when I, when I, when I learned about the Pearl as one course that you made uh, uh, several years ago, I did the course, as you know, when you, you were my instructor, I really remember asking you questions and you did have time to respond to all of them, which is amazing. And then I wanted to do online courses and, and sent you a couple of emails and you were so generous and you inspired me to do my own thing. And uh, now I'm doing online courses and doing webinars and I'm totally digital now. And uh, thanks to you. So uh, you were inspiring me. Thank you very, very much. You're very welcome, Rui. And yeah. it's been a pleasure to be your inspiration um, since Bangkok. Um, I met you in 2017. It's only been a couple of years. And uh, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a fun couple of years getting to know you, Rui. Yeah, and, and you met Edward Johnson uh, like a couple of weeks ago at the CIBJO webinar, right, Edward? Yeah, we, we had the pleasure of having Jeremy on our Cultured Pearl webinar just a few weeks back, so it's good to see you again, Jeremy. You as well, Edward. First of all, I always do this. Uh, if you want to review all the past videos of the webinars, they are available on my website, regalpin.com. You can also check them out at my Instagram or LinkedIn or Facebook accounts. And if you want to read uh, articles uh, on the blog, which is on the website, you can also read one. And one of the blogs, which is illustrated here with a Tiffany brooch, is actually on American pearls, American natural and um, cultured pearls. So uh, make sure if you liked um, uh, American pearls and American history, make sure you read that blog. And also, um, uh, this, is, uh, this webinar is supported by Sibjo, the World Jewelry Confederation. Make sure you drop by the Sibjo website, sibjo.org, and you download all the blue books that are all available for free now, as well as the Do's and Don'ts Guide, which is a guide translated in, I think, 16 languages, which you can download and uh, read about how to ethically and responsibly trade in diamonds, colored gemstones, pearls, and corals. Um, this is going, as Edward said, we are going to make a little stop, but just to remind you that we've done so far 26 uh, webinars, and those are the covers of all of those topics that they will eventually will be on YouTube. But if you want to see the stats, the statistics, this is like the curve, and we see that the majority of our attendance was during the really tough uh, confin confinement period in late March and uh, during the whole April and early May. That, that, in that period, we had like thousands of people attending our webinars because everybody was basically at home. And uh, in general, um, as a statistic, we started in March 20. We did 48 live sessions. 
and we we invited uh, approximately 20,000 registrants, which is uh, actually amazing. And on your part, Edward, uh, you started a, a little bit before, right? A little bit after, and we're yeah. a little bit smaller, but we're a little bit more focused, shall we say. Sometimes some would say we're a little bit more professional, but I wouldn't say that, but some have said, um, and yes, we have less people, but we're small, but perfectly formed. We've, we've had almost 6,000 um, attendees over the, the 14 sessions that we've had. We, we've had more show guests than you though. So if we're playing top trumps, if you know that game um, that kids play with little cards with details, um, we have more guests than you. So we're, we're winning in that station. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, it's, it's on record. I cannot reply. In you a, have no comment. I know. No, I, know. I have no comment. No That's a, thank you so much, Edward. This has been uh, this has been a privilege to work with you through these weeks and through these months. And uh, when I started these webinars, I remember we were already chatting on how to do this. So you have been here since day one. As I remember, Enzo Liberino, my good friend from uh, Napoli, he was also a great supporter since they won and a great inspiration too. So credit to Enzo as well. And so uh, as Edward said, our webinars, both the jewelry industry voices and especially the home gemology will resume in September and they will be announced in September. So stay tuned. Uh, if you want to log into my website, subscribe the newsletter and uh, you will get all the notifications soon. And this is my best pitch. Uh, body language that I'm not a salesperson, so I, I'm not good in uh, pitching. So, but the, uh, the meaning of our, our meeting today is not actually our past webinars, it's today's webinar and today's guest. And today's guest, Jeremy Shefford, he's the CEO of Pearl Paradise, a huge retail company selling uh, cultured pearls. And uh, he's also the founder uh, one of the founders of the Pearl Guide, uh, which is like the website that everybody goes to when they want to know something about pearls and, uh, and ask questions. And also the founder, author and instructor of the Pearls as One online course that I was a student back two or three years ago. And um, many of you, I know that you were also students of that brilliant online course on cultural pearls. So he was behind it and uh, he is also um, a board member of the Cultural Pearl Association of America. And he's our guest today. And so it's my privilege, my honor uh, to invite him to the floor. Um, uh, if you can unmute yourself and put your videos on, let me, okay, there you go, Master Jeremy. And now you are all set. All right, Welcome, you still Jeremy, got, you still to got the my... Apology webinars. There we go. Hey, how are you, Rui? Thanks I'm for having great. me today. I'm popped up, yeah. Uh, and uh, as you saw, this is, uh, and you've done, uh, I, think, I think you are one of the few that has done uh, one with Edward in the Jewelry Voices and one with me. And in the end, you will have to tell me. Yeah, no, 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 that's no competition, no competition. I already know the question and it's a little early to tell you now, Rui, but I'll know in about an hour um, yeah. and I'll make sure and tell Ed first, no matter what the answer is. <laughs> Thanks. The check's in the post, Jeremy. Good man. As, as an Italian say in English, up to you, up to you. <laughs> so when an Italian says up to you, it means that you better, you better choose well, choose wisely, <laughs> otherwise. So, uh, Jeremy, as, as, uh, as you know and I know, and most of us that love pearls know that there is a lot uh, of literature on natural pearls, on saltwater cultured pearls, the South Seas, the Akoyas, the Tahitians, the Fijians, even the Mexicans, but there isn't that much on freshwaters, specifically on the most modern ones. And uh, yeah. I remember during my studies and even on, on your great pearls as one course, I learned about uh, Masao Fujita and his early attempts in the Biwa Lake and also the later attempts in the Kasumiga Ura, uh, which is a Kasumiga Lake also in Japan, the hybrids and the fact that the hybrid was hidden for so many decades uh, by the Chinese and the many other things on the early production of cultured pearls, but much has evolved 
since the rice crisps, which is the smaller ones made in Cristaria plicata shell, and many others like the, the Biwa pearls, and also the Kasumiga and the Fujita ones, if you wish. So a lot has evolved and maybe a lot has to do with the technology and biology and science. And in the last 20 years, much have changed. And you, because you travel a lot to China and to Vietnam, where those pearls are basically made, you have fresh information on that. What can you serve us today as a treat on the last 20 years of uh, freshwater cultured pearl production? Wow, Rui, it's quite an introduction. Um, freshwater pearls. Well, you know, for the last 20 years, this is really when we've been seeing um, sort of a shift in the freshwater pearl industry, a shift from the, the traditional tissue nucleation to more of a, a focus on bead and uh, beaded freshwater pearls and culturing with other type things like you've heard of mud, you've heard that people have actually used pearls to grow pearls. So this has really all happened in the last 20 years. Um, and um, that's about how long I've been in the business too. I've been in the business just over 20 years. So I was fortunate enough to, to get into China and start visiting the freshwater pearl farms about around 20, I'm sorry, 2000, the year 2000. It's about 20 years ago. And, and that was about um, yeah, the over the last 20 years, uh, go ahead. And that was about the time that the hybrids became more pumped up into the, uh, into the uh, production. And maybe people don't know what, a high, what, what we are talking about, but basically freshwater cultured pearls were made in two main shells. One from Japan, the Lake Biwa uh, mussel, which is the Iriopsis schlegeli, and the triangle shell, which is the Chinese uh, Iriopsis kumingi. And they made a hybrid, which biologically, they just mix them up together. And they make a new uh, hybrid species that were more suitable for production. And uh, you started to visit on, on the years that the first productions of those hybrids were coming, were coming up? Yeah, so I went over there, I believe it was in 2002. I went with Doug Fisk, um, the pearl course writer for GIA. And it was shortly after um, the article had come out in Gems and Gemology. I believe it came out in summer of 2000, the one written by um, um, Kenneth Skerritt. And it was Kenneth Skerritt, uh, Tom Moses um, played a part, so did Chigeru Akamatsu. Basically, they had tested 41,000 pearls. They cut a bunch of them in half. They came from pearl farms all over China. They were trying to determine whether or not pearls were grown with um, pearls. Basically, uh, the theory was at the time that um, farmers were harvesting small freshwater pearls and they were then um, rounding them, turning them into round shapes and then reinserting them for a second growth. And that was determined, well, that was theorized why round pearls were starting to come out of China. And, and the reality was is much more like you say, uh, Rui, and you've kind of touched on it a little bit and then you went a bit deeper. The first was from the Cristaria plicata, when um, you know 40 up to 50 implants were put into a single shell. You know that's where you got the small pearls, the wrinkly pearls, the rice crispy pearls, low quality pearls. Then the Chinese industry switched to the Hieropsis kumingi, which is the triangle shell, Chinese the San Jiao Pang uh, shell. And you had mentioned in Japan they used the Hieropsis schlegeli. Well, you could almost call the Hieropsis schlegeli the island version of the Hieropsis kumingi. And so what the Japanese did is they hybridized this shell to use in Lake Biwa. And, and you're right, we didn't hear a lot about that at the time. We, I remember, recall reading things about the shell they used. But when the shell was taken to China around this same time, um, what I found at the time was a lot of the information became public. It became public in Chinese journals. And so when Doug Fisk and I went to China and started um, uh, researching deeper into this new phenomenon of, of bee nucleated pearls, we, we read and we found that yes, they had brought over the Japanese Hieropsis Schlegeli shell, they had hybridized it with the Kumingi shell, and they found uh, heterosis using the new, or they found that the new shell, um, it, it lived longer, it lasted longer, supposedly the pearls grew bigger, and from the ones that I've opened, you've got a, 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 a slight difference in the shape of the shell with a hybrid. You've got between the two valves, 
near the near the hinge there's a space and the space can grow four or five inches uh deep in some of the bigger shells and this is where i believe anyway um I'm, we're seeing these giant giant pearls come and i've seen pearls up to 50 millimeters granted broke but um but they have to come from a big shell can, can i stop it right there because one of the things that maybe people also don't know is uh, on the early days of uh, freshwater culturing uh, processes, the culturing was made on the mantle and more recently has shifted also to the gonad. So uh, is there, uh, was the hybrid more receptive to a culturing process or grafting process, if you wish, in the gonads, which is the sexual organs, poor, poor muscle. Uh, but they were, the sexual organs were invaded by a, by a shell bead and some say also a tridacna shell bead. In, I don't know if, they, if it, it's true or not, that tridacna, they were also used in the past. But uh, does it have also to do with uh, the fact that the hybrid is better also for gonad growing? So, um, yeah, the, um, the original shell is much more difficult to, um, to nucleate within the body. I believe it's something roid around the intestines or wrapped around the inside of the body. Um, but, um, the bead itself, um, you know, interestingly, um, I've got a photo here. I think I should share with you. It'll yeah, touch yeah. a little bit on what you're just talking about. You're right. I believe you're right on the Tridacna bead. Um, I don't have solid evidence of this, but yeah. when we did come back from China, um, I believe in 2003, 2004, we did test one of the beads from one of the, um, bead nucleated freshwater pearls and it came back saltwater. So, um, you know, if you've got a bead that doesn't have any manganese in it, if it's a saltwater bead, it's going to be MOP or most likely Tridacna, because Tridacna sorry, has... Sorry, has well, when you say MOP, is mother of pearl, right? Right, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah MOP, okay. it's, it's rarely used, but my friend Josh Humbert has made uh, pearl nuclei out of it. For the most part, it's going to be your standard freshwater muscle shell, whether that's a muscle, cell, muscle shell from China, whether it's a muscle, muscle shell from the US, Ohio River Valley, Mississippi River Valley, you name it. That's the typical bead. What they're using today, I'm not sure. Um, I've seen a lot of really large freshwater shells come out of China. Um, I do know at the time though, with the, with the Tridacna beads, they're almost impossible to drill. And so you could always tell when you've got a Tridacna, when you had a Tridacna bead at the time, because often the pearls would crack, you would need a, a double-sided drill just to get to the center of the pearl. But speaking to the point of you asked where in the shell itself, let me pull up a picture really quick and share my other Thank screen. Um, you can see this screen. This is, this is my hand here. And this is uh, harvesting a souffle pearl. And what I was showing in this picture was just that the pearl really was capturing some of the different colors that you see in, in the shell itself. But what you'll also see in the shell, which I think you'll find somewhat interesting, is you'll see that down on the bottom right-hand side, you see uh, pearls that are attached into the shell. And, and so what you're seeing there is you're seeing a single shell that had been used more than once. And, and so if you see down in here um, where you've got basically fireballs, well, those fireballs are starting where originally you had a tissue graft. And so a lot of times what you'll find with these shells is they don't necessarily start just with a bead. Um, when Doug Fisk and I were in China, part of the article we wrote was on how these pearls are created. And what we found in China was they would start the shells with a coin because the shells were really thin. They would grow out the pearl sack. They would harvest that first coin pearl. And then they could leave the coin, uh, shell back in the water, grow a quote unquote Keishi pearl. And we all know they're not really Keishi pearls, but that's what they're called in the trade. Um, and then harvest that Keishi pearl and insert a bead into that pearl sack. So, so there's two different types of bead nucleated pearls from the early um, time. The first was in the, in the mantle, which is what you're seeing here with these pearls stuck on the shell. And then what you're describing is in the gonad. And that's slightly different. That's in body nucleation. And that's where you get the other types of pearls, things like the, uh, the ripple pearls, the round pearls, and the really large pearls. And, and we'll go into that as well, too. So, uh, but you can see this pearl, uh, this shell is one we harvested at this farm. 
Um, and there's and me. Back Jeremy, was... let me stop you right there. Yeah. I think most people, they are not aware of the size that those shells can grow to. It's, they are really huge. They are almost as large or larger as Pintata Massimas from Australia that are, I mean, the, the biggest pearl uh, oysters and those pearl mussels, those are really big. And uh, uh, is the, the process that you were mentioning, I think it was mentioned in the uh, in a GIA article as a coin bead, a shell bead process. C, uh, CBSB. CBSB. I, I, was was... The I was the author of that article already. Oh, were you? Yes. Uh, <laughs> 2007. I, I wrote that <laughs> article, Gems and Gemology, with, with, uh, with Doug Fisk. In fact, um, crazy thing. Um, after 2000, when that article came out, I was over in China and I was visiting one of, um, actually, it was coming back from China. I was in Hong Kong. I was in an office in Hong Kong. And after the article in 2000 came out that said that, uh, you know, shells were not being nucleated with pearls. There weren't bead nucleated pearls coming out, at least in mass. And um, I was in an office and the vendor brought out a bag of pearls and um, they were all shaped like these weird, almost like comets. My friend um, Jack Lynch eventually started calling them fireballs, but it was a strand of weird tail like pearls. And it was explained to me that these were bead nucleated pearls. And, and it was intriguing to me because I just read the article saying that, you know, experiments are happening, but it really wasn't happening in China. And all these stories I'd read about, I think Ward had written on it, Matlins had written on it, that um, really weren't um, the reality. Suddenly I was faced with a, a new reality coming out of China. Those pearls, and I'm not going to get too far away from the um, the uh, you can. I, I can I can feel the I can feel the audio for you because I have one question about there they are. yeah those are the early ones these are the early ones and so I I um, and you actually can see these strands of pearls in two places um the first is in Modern Jeweler magazine in two thousand and six and I also put these strands in the um, Gems and Gemology article in two thousand and seven. But yeah, so these were, and I'll put these on a uh, on another camera here momentarily in just a moment that'll give you a much better view of them. But these were the um, the first denucleated pearls that came out of China about 20 years ago. And uh, let, let let me ask you, are those like the? I think it was in your article that uh, I read that in 2002, around that uh, time, the luster of the so-called fireballs was lower, was not as good as the latest production. What changed from 20 years ago to now? Well, first, these are, um, of course, very, very few and far between. They were very few and very, I would, I would, I hesitate to call freshwater per pearls rare ever because they're really not. But at the time, these were um, <coughs> more experimental. And, and so, um, Yes, technology has grown and yes, technology has improved. But one thing you've got to remember is that what you see in freshwater pearls, um, when you see pearls that are beautiful, really, really highly lustrous, you're not seeing the rule, you're seeing the exception. And if you've got 1500 metric tons or 1000 metric tons, depending on which year it is that China is producing, and you see, uh, um, you know, a handful or, or, you know, a few kilos of super, super fine material, that's not representative of what is being grown. And so even this quality that I've got here where the luster is a bit lower, uh, you can find similar qualities. Now, granted, I, say, I think the color is a bit different. Um, of course, these have aged a little bit as well. And, you know, pearls are, uh, freshwater pearls are porous. So they're a little bit creamier than what I would typically see. But let me put these actually in a- um, Very good idea in a better place, you can see them up close. And I'll switch cameras. I've got it now, it's spotlit now. You got it? Yeah, I think. And by, so by the way, can that see. Kate Wyatt, she's asking us to spell this different shell names, please. And I'm going, while Jeremy is explaining, I'm going to write it down on the chat, uh, okay? So uh, to, to make it clear, the, both the Latin names and the, and the vernaculars in English. So you can see these, these pearls there. And so all these pearls have been gonad grown. I'm, I'm sorry, not gonad grown. They've been mantle grown. My apologies. 
And so these came out of um, the, the CVSB that you were just referencing, the Gems and Gemology article of 2007, but these were grown before that. And you can see here, I'll point this out right here. You see this, this almost like a, an edge to the pearl over here that creates this sort of fireball effect. And that comes from the flaccid nature of the pearl sac. The, uh, a pearl was harvested, a bead was shoved into the pearl sac to regrow a, a second generation pearl or even a third generation pearl. And you can see that when the bead was shoved in, it didn't quite fill the entire pearl sac. And so, so that, that loose part of the sac well, it's still a pearl sac, so it still has epithelial cells that are secreting um, calcium carbonate. It's still creating nacre. So the pearl sac is going to grow a pearl wherever it is. And so what it created was sort of a pearl with almost like a fireball end to it with, um, with a tail. And so, so that was the first generation. And so when these first started coming out, um, it wasn't until a couple of years after, I want to say possibly in 2004, 2005, when Jack Lynch brought a beautiful, um, he's a, um, a pearl dealer here in the United States, but a, brought a beautiful strand of, of large pearls, more, let me see if I can find some. Jack, actually, he was the one naming souffle pearls as such, right? Yes, Jack named souffle pearls. He named fireball pearls. Yeah. Um, he's he's an incredibly creative, creative guy, and um, yeah, he um, he was the first one to bring these pearls to the market and show the true beauty of what they could be. And let me find a few more pearls that really kind of capture that. So wow. I'll show you what they look like here. So and just to um, clarify, those are grown in the hybrids in Reopsis shell, right? Yeah, so these are these are grown in the hybrid. Now I'm not going to say these early the pearls that I just showed you were grown in the um the Hyropsis Schlegeli Hyropsis Kamingi hybrid. Uh, the reason is is because those those pearls I found, I believe, in 2001. And um the articles that I had I read and researched um in, in China didn't really reference bringing over the Hierapolis Schlegeli until around that same time. So I believe the hybridization started a couple of years later. And so what you're looking at now is more of a second generation of these, um, of these pearls. In fact, this is, this is a souffle. I shouldn't have included that one. Um, and Jeremy, see... for a second generation pearl, the luster is quite beautiful. Usually, yeah. the older the pearl, the lesser the luster, right? So or what you're describing, you're really describing something you see a lot more in, in, in saltwater pearls than you see in freshwater pearls. What you're describing is the reason why you don't see a lot of, um, you know, second and third harvests in, in, in Tahiti. It's, it's more a rarity. It's an exception, not the rule. Whereas in China, that's not the case. Mm. In China, you don't need these baby shells to to you know pr produce high luster in fact um i find the larger pearls especially the larger pearls that are grown deep in in the uh the shell in that cavity that i was telling you about often have great luster and i think i was showing you a picture um the picture that i showed you a few moments ago of the shell that we were opening in china i'm looking over at it now um uh, just to share this screen and while this you're doing a, that, while you're doing that, Jeremy, you, harvest. Jeremy, while you're doing yeah. that, can I just clarify when you're talking about second generation, okay, you're talking that that's the second time the muscle has created a pearl. That's correct. And so in second generation growing, you, you'll sometimes hear it called the second graft. And, and um, because Rui's here and I don't want him to correct me because I know he will. It's, it's not a second graft because there's no graft tissue that's added this time. The pearl sac already exists. You only need to grow a pearl sac once, and that's what the tissue is for. So when we say second generation, what that means is a pearl has been harvested, and the shell has either, in the case of a freshwater mussel shell, been closed and put back into the water to grow more of a free-form pearl in that existing pearl sac, or a bead has been inserted into that pearl sac to grow another pearl. Now, this happens in Tahiti as well in other countries. In Tahiti, for example, um, 
you grow keishi pearls not because they harvest a pearl and put it back in the water that you grow second generation pearls because they harvest a pearl and insert a bead where the pearl was now if they don't insert a pearl um, insert a bead back into that sack it'll and they return it to the water it still will grow a quote unquote keishi which in the trade nomenclature wise it can be called a keishi, keishi then um at least because it's salt water but um and i let's not get into that argument Rui. Uh, and um if the bead is re, uh, rejected um after the after the first graft for example and the shell is left in the water then it will grow a keishi pearl as well because even though the bead isn't in there the tissue still is in there and so for example some farms might uh, place nettings. I believe Robert Wan did this. Place nettings underneath the uh, net. Uh, I'm sorry, baskets underneath the nets to catch the nuclei if they fall, and have those nuclei specifically marked to the shell that are inside the net, so that they can determine which shells rejected their nuclei. Well, then instead of like renucleating that shell or harvesting that shell so it doesn't take away from um, crowd the other shells, they might just take that shell and throw it into a place in the lagoon where it can grow out for a few years and create a giant quote unquote keishi pearls so that's what i mean by second generation pearl i think i know exactly why those well, second generations have a better luster because they they do a lot of soda they drink a lot of soda and uh, when we go to pearl farms in china we see all the leftovers of soda near the near the muscles so i'm sure that it has to do with soda Soda, soda, soda. Okay, soda bottles. You know, everybody talks about soda bottles in, in, in China and the Pearl Farms. Let me pull up some shots for you, Rui. Um, here we go. All right, let me share, uh, grab the screen really quick. Is this what you're talking about? Yes. Yep. Yeah. That's the proof that they are drinking. <laughs> if you if you look really closely at these bottles, Rui, um, uh, they're drinking, but not what you're accustomed to in Italy. Um, they look more like uh, soda bottles to me, or you know, potentially uh, water bottles. But you can see this this farmer right here. He's he's pulling up these lines to get to the nets, and just in his uh, to the right of his hand, you'll see that the nets right here aren't that low. And so there are different times where they'll go higher, they'll go lower. I mean, when the, uh, um, you know, from the very start, when the glochidia drops off from the carp, goes down into the mud, I mean, it, they use the entire pond for the time of their, from, for, for, for their life cycle. But the farmer then attaches them into these nets onto these lines and floats it with these soda bottles. And if you've ever been to a farm in the Pacific or any saltwater farm in the ocean for that matter, you can see why you, you would understand why these wouldn't work very well anywhere other than a freshwater pearl farm. Um, but they work great there and you can see them, they're everywhere. And um, also this is just really driving around Suji uh, area of China where there's pearl farms literally everywhere. And everyone like uses the same thing. It like Heath Ponds where Master Edward does his swimming in eight degrees Celsius water, doesn't it Edward? Well, thank you. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I'd like to swim in that water particularly. It's, but it, it's full of pearls, man, and it, it has yeah. free soda. Thank you so much. I'll I'll consider it. <laughs> wait, but, wait. But, uh, one question, Jeremy, uh, uh, concerning temperature and concerning the uh, the depth where the, the muscles are put together. Uh, usually, we are told for saltwater cultural pearls that uh, it, uh, 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 closer to the harvesting time, they deepen the uh, shells deeper so the temperature gets lower and the nacre gets better. Does it apply also to these muscles? Well, this is interesting that you asked that. And, and it, it, it can, but there's, there's quite a bit more to it than that. Um, are you still seeing my Pearl Farm uh, picture on my other yes. screen? Okay. You'll see that there's farms everywhere here. And, and uh, you'll see this house in the background. This is kind of a family farm. Um, and it, it's not remote, but it's, it, it's poor. And, um, and actually, this is a really great photo as well. This is a photo of a pearl farm that's been drained. And you can see that this can now be used to grow rice. 
and, and so they're not they're not pearl farmers the way you're going to think of your your Paspales, your your Branelex, uh, McLarens, the Humberts, you know, not not in that way. If the price of pearls go prices pearl prices go down and rice prices go up, well, they'll drain their farm and they'll start planting rice. And and so also pearl farmers are not they're not out for the goal necessarily of pr producing the perfect gem, which is really I would say the purpose of nearly every other pearl farming industry out there, at least the ones that I'm familiar with in Australia, Indonesia, etc. It's it's about producing more of a crop, and so yes, the pearl farmers will move their pearls, but they may also, if they're growing tissue grafted pearls for say six years, well, that's a long investment. So they may not leave their pearls or their shells in the water for six years. They may sell them after two years to another farmer who grows them for four years, or maybe another two years who might sell them to another farmer. And in the end, they may just sell the entire harvest shells unopened to a processor. Now, during that time, you're going to get a lot of movement. And so with freshwater pearls, you can harvest any time of the year, but it's not, it's not as tied directly into that, that window that you see in Japan. But it is typically done in, you know, in the winter months as well. But you can harvest all throughout the year, and people do harvest all throughout the year. And they move the pearls around to different pearl farms. And so when you do move them to different pearl farms, you're changing environments. You're changing the mineral um, contents in the water. You go back 10 years, you're changing the chemicals that were put into the water if you want to get into the environmental aspect of it in the biosphere. So you're seeing a lot of changes that happen to these pearls in part because of the farming process, in part because of the culturing process when pearls are moved around. So yes, up and down in the water as well, but also outside of the water um, into different pearl farms. And Edward, I, I noticed that in a couple a couple of minutes ago, you wanted to say something, and I I, I think I interrupted. Maybe you wanted. Oh, it's to... okay. I'm just trying to address as we're going along and trying to address some of the questions that are going in. So Kenneth Cole is asking, how deep are those ponds when they're full of water? How deep are they, Jeremy? So. Um... You know, I've walked into these things before. You don't want to, by the way, um, because I think the mud is about as deep as the water. Um, but I believe the average is about um, one to two meters. So okay. they're, not, they're not too deep. And, and there's ponds for growing out the glochidia, growing out the spat, and there's farms for farming. Um, but as you could see in the photo I just showed, the, the shells don't really have to go that deep in the water. Whereas like in a saltwater pearl farm, you might have you know, the shells, um, Julmer's farm, for example, when we dove down on the line, we went down as deep as 25 meters. So um, you don't have that same sort of depth necessity with freshwater shells as you do with saltwater mollusks. And, and what sort of labor intensity do you have in the farming here? I mean, so, you know what? I can just talk about it or I can show some more pictures. Let me look. Grab pictures are cool pictures. and talk and pictures work well. What, what's that? Talk and pictures work talk well. Talk and pictures. All right. So why don't we go into, uh, you know, I've got just a couple of pictures here. Uh, show you, I'll show you a picture of the grafting. And, and so this is the first step of the process after the shells have been uh, basically calmed down and, and, and pried open. And so, uh, uh, hold on, this thing's really sensitive. Now, now you can see this technician here um, inserting these, these grafts. These are tissue pieces from a donor muscle um, that someone out of frame right now you can't see is actually his only job, his or her only job is cutting off that inner lip. And you can basically see a little bit of that inner lip in the shell that's been pried open a little bit where, um, you know, you see the little white meat in there. So this is the mantle. That's the mantle. That's where the, she is making an incision. That's where she's inputting this, this piece of mantle tissue. Now, you can see the mantle tissue on the end of her needle. And one of the things that you'll notice here, and I think this is key, um, if, if you're familiar with saltwater growing, you'll know that the squares are typically perfect squares, and they're also very small. They only may be one to two millimeters in diameter, maybe up to three. 
she's using quite a bit of a larger, a larger piece of, of mantle tissue. And I haven't done this procedure personally, but I've read, I've heard, and I've understand, understood that the method of inserting this tissue is done to create almost like a twist, almost to create a rounded ball. I've heard it called like a, a soybean shape of, of tissue so that when the, um, the cells start to regenerate and, and the, the top layer that has the epithelial cells, which is still living, starts to, to grow and create that pearl sac, and then the other side of it, um, which may still be attached, dissolves, you're going to have a larger pearl sac that, that hopefully, theoretically, could be more round or produce more of a round pearl, even though it's inside of the muscle of the shell. Because you can see the insertion is really just into that white piece of meat that you can see inside of that shell. So this process itself is quick. It's really quick for each one of the graphs. Uh, but as you can see, she's got, um, you know, probably up to about 16 on either side. So they can go up to average of about 32 if they're just doing tissue graphs. And you can see by the size of the shell, it's a small shell. So um, this process can be done by a lot of people all at the same time. And, and so what you're seeing here now is, is um, a lineup. And, and by the way, this is just one row. This is in an outdoor tent. And, and these women, and, and they're all women, almost exclusively women, because um, they're considered to have better eyesight. And they've got to be young. And they're, and they're very well paid. So what they do is they go from farm to farm to farm. And so what these women are doing is they're working at one of these small family farms. And you saw these images, they're everywhere. And so they'll go from farm to farm. And this particular tent, I believe there were two long rows of, of these ladies who were grafting these shells all day long. And so this process could take a week, two weeks, but then you can literally have hundreds of thousands of shells on this farm um, in, in a short amount of time. I'll turn it back to you, Rui, for any questions. Yeah, I, I have one, I think one last question before I hand you over to the hands of our co-host, Edward Johnson, that will choose really difficult questions for you to answer, um, which I, 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 in, the, in the early days, are, um, maybe, and even more recently, we see also beads that are drilled, and that you insert drilled beads into the shell, especially on gonads uh, grown on processes. Why is the bead uh, uh, drilled? Why is that so? Because in the, also in the, in the so-called Ming pearls, it can cause the, the circling, uh, the typical circling that sometimes we see. We can see them in Taishian cultured pearls and, the, and also on, on freshwaters. But that uh, 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 reportedly that circling in Ming pearls has to do with the fact that the drill, that the uh, beads, the shell bead is actually drilled. Can you comment on that? Yeah, um, I've heard it too. And uh, I mean, I know, yeah, absolutely. There have been drilled beads used. And I know that was the way things were done in Le Kasumiga Ura. I'd even heard, um, I read a story. I don't think I heard this. I think I read an article once that found that they had even used low-grade drilled Akoya pearls um, as, as the nucleus. Um, basically the same thing, a mother uh, a freshwater mussel shell bead with a, just a little bit of nacre around it. My understanding on this process, and, and it goes back to, again, not a lot of literature out there, but my understanding of the process is that the hole is used to for two purposes. First, to insert the bead into, into the shell, um, and secondly, to attach the tissue graft to the shell. Um, my understanding is, is it wouldn't stay next to the bead the way it needs to stay next to the bead the way it would in a saltwater mollusk um, and grow that pearl sac around it. So what they're doing is they're attaching the and shoving the tissue into, into this hole. That's how I've understood it. That's how the articles I read have explained it to me, to my understanding. Um, you don't always see that. That was something that was um, found in Akasumi Aura pearls. And I know the earliest 
um, I think they're called, they were called ripple pearls after that. And those the in-body nucleation before they moved into that smooth gonad shape. Those were done with the drill pearls. I remember Fuji Vol brought over one of the first strands of ripple pearls, we'll call them. And I've actually got a couple of those strands, so I'll show them to you as well. Yeah, good. And some of these first pearls were x-rayed and they did show holes in, in the nucleus, but that's not always the case. And I'm going to show you some pearls that have been cut in half. And you'll see that they don't have those holes in there and they, and they are fireball pearls. So first let's go to um, the in-body nukes, the original, um, they're called ripple pearls now. This is one of the very, very early strands and you can see that the pearls themselves have more of a textured surface. And before I show them on this smaller camera, I'll show them up in front so you can get a gauge of the size. You see, they yeah. grow quite a bit larger than um, some of the smaller tissue nuke freshwaters. And then they start taking on the shape similar to saltwater. So um, here is, and let me switch cameras. I'll, I'll do it. It's spotlight. Oh, perfect. Okay, so this is one of the early um, in body nucleation, and you can see the difference when um, you're in the body of the muscle instead of in the gonad. You don't have the pressure of the, the mantle muscle that's, that's creating that more of a smooth surface. These sort of grow a little more freely in the body of the shell. And then you can get to some slightly larger sizes, which I believe can really only grow in that cavity that I was telling you about. Because although this is a big strand of pearls, I believe this goes up to about 15 millimeters in the center you'll see a lot larger. You'll see even larger than this as well. But you can also see the colors are really starting to take on the same colors of the shell that I, that I showed you earlier. Now, when you get into the gonad, and this is where you're talking about the, the, the potentially, um, um, you know, like what they were doing um, um, in, in Kasumi Ura, where they're uh, growing them inside the gonad, you can see some of these shapes start to take on more of what we see in the saltwater shape of pearl, the shape of that gonad, more of the drop shape, and they start to become a little bit smoother too. And, and so the colors are still really good, but they start to become really smooth, uh, quite a lot more smooth and, um, and, and colorful. Now inside of these pearls, inside of these pearls, first you've got the outside, you can see the outside, it is, it's a fireball pearl. You can see beautiful, beautiful luster. And it fades a little bit on this end. And that's really important to point out if you can see, and I'll show you why in a moment as well. And, it, and you've got a lot more orient and a lot of color on this. And now the best of these pearls, you you're going to have that same amount over here. Can you bring it closer to the camera? So it's hard to see that. It is. But let me show you why you're going to have more color and more luster on the other side. And I think this is going to be really, really important for people to see because this kind of takes you to the danger of fireball pearls and knowing how to purchase fireball pearls. And when you do purchase fireball pearls, pearls, knowing how to select the fireball, fire, ugh. fireball pearls at six o'clock in the morning, I get a lot of tongue twisters. So, so my wife, um, my wife cut these in half. And, and my wife, um, my wife is uh, Hisano Shepherd, little eight. She has this line of jewelry where she cuts pearls in half and sets stones inside of them. It's, it's yes, brilliant. Beautiful. So, so she cut this in half to show us. Now, um, you can see it looks like it's almost nothing but bead. Now watch. That's how thin the nacre is on this edge. Wow. That's how thin the nacre is. And so let me, now I can't seem to grab the pearl. Let me show you. Now, this is not a line from a, uh, this is simply a line from the, uh, the saw. That's why I didn't show this side first. But look how thin this nacre is. It is, yeah. It's almost nothing but bead. So, so um, these early pearls, especially these early, um, these early fireballs, were all pretty much like this. I've also cut in half one of these fireballs. Isano cut one of these in half yesterday as well. And it's almost hard to hold on to, but you can see the nacre is a little bit thicker, maybe a bit thicker than a koya, which you know averages about 0.5 to about one. 
for the for a good quality Akoya, but still but still really thin. So um, and I'm only pointing that out because a lot of people don't know that about Fireball Pearls, and um, and so if you're out buying fire, Fireball Pearls or shopping for Fireball Pearls, the difference between a a well I'm going to call it a well nakered Fireball Pearl and a not well nakered Fireball Pearl can make the difference of your strand falling apart when you're wearing it because it's a heavy strand. It's a heavy strand of pearls. Um, but the ones that do have thick nacre, and by the way, thick nacre would be more like these. Yeah. So wow. these pearls, you can see color on all sides, thick, thick nacre on all sides. And these are more of the creme de la creme of, of fireball pearls. Beautiful. Jeremy, and while you're pausing, there's a lot of discussion on the chat as to whether the oysters feel any pain during these procedures. The, those are not oysters, are mussels. Sorry, mussels, thank you. Muscles. Oh, blue, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they are unionide, they are unio, unio mollusks. Thank you. Yeah, um, that, that's a great question. That's a great question. And, um, and, and I feel that that question many, many times, as you're, you're probably aware, especially on, on Pearl Guide and, and, and Pearls is One. And a little background on myself, I am nearly uh, completely pescatarian and mostly vegetarian. Um, and, and so um, I'm going to sp you know, speak to this from my understanding of this and the way I feel of this is that, uh, you know, Pearl oysters and pearl mussels are, 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 are precious to me. They're, they're really, really, really precious. And, and they grow, I believe, the most beautiful gem on the planet. Um, the old story about the irritant or, or shells feeling the irritant from sand or feeling a little bit of pain and needing to, to coat that intruder with, um, with nacre so they feel comfortable so it's not irritating the inside of them is really from a scientific perspective myth. Well, first, um, you know, I used to keep in the course because people argued with me and argued with me that sand rarely ever grew a, a natural pearl. Laurent challenged me on this, Laurent Cartier challenged me on this because he asked, why are you even saying sometimes? I've never seen sand inside of a pearl before. Why would you just say, not say never? Or something to that effect. So I changed the course to, 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 uh, to go and uh, to follow what Laurent, um, um, suggested, but mollusks don't have a brain. Um, and in fact, they have nerve endings on these phalange things that, um, you know, that communicate on a cellular chemical level, but they don't have a brain. They're unable to process things the way we process things. And when someone asks me about pain, and when they ask me about pain, and especially from a perspective of a shell or a perspective of an, of an animal. And I'll take that even a step further from the perspective of an animal. To me, pain and suffering is the defining factor for what kind of meat I'll eat, for example. Um, um, and animals are conscious. Animals can feel pain. They have a brain. They can think. They can see. They can interact. Muscles, mollusks, they don't. They exist. So while, while they're in the animal kingdom, you may consider them animals, they're much more, they're similar, more similar to plants that react to their environment instead of proactively engage with their environment, if, if, if that answers your question. Now, now, I may not have touched on all the clearest scientific points, but I've never uh, dove you, really you deep into this. This is my understanding of it. And your clarity, I mean, it, it was like an epiphany now, because now I know for sure that the bottles are not soda. I think they are liquor. So, they, <laughs> so th that is a clarification. And you gave me another clarification that if muscles are closer to vegetables than, than meat than animals, maybe vegetarians, they can eat the seafood and shrimp and uh, not shrimp, the clams and the, you know. So yeah, that's a, that's a good one. So you can eat- Rui, your, you right? would make an amazing pearl farmer, Rui, um, just because you, you like to fantasize and you've got big dreams. You'd make a big, great pearl farmer. So I just, I just like to have fun. And uh, 
one of the things that uh, um, we usually we usually associate freshwater cultured pearls with lower value, right? With with the with the, the gem materials with not an, as expensive as uh, South Sea cultured pearls or natural pearls for all that matter. Uh, but sometimes they, they, they if they have really good quality, they can be rather expensive, right? Oh yeah. Um, here I'll show you some. Good. Um, let's see. Here, I'm going to grab up some more that I'm going to want to talk about because these are really, really special pearls. These are special pearls too, so let me put them over here before I switch to those. Um, let me switch to my camera, camera phone here just so you can see what I'm doing. All right, Rui? So, yep. Oh, is it on Spotlight? All right, it's on Spotlight. Those are all freshwater cultured pearls, right? Oh, what a colors, beautiful colors. And the, even the darker one is natural color. These are all natural color. Wow. So what I'll do, um, let me put this back in here. Let me go and first of all, let's, let's talk about um, really quickly the switch from Cristaria Placata to the um, to the Hyropsis kumingi and the difference the pearls made. So these are about as good as you can get in, in tissue graft, tissue nuked, no bead. Okay, so these are round and really, really lustrous. These are what we would call mostly eight-way rollers or nearly eight-way rollers. They're nearly perfectly wow. round and, and the luster is what I refer to as metallic. Um, it's a there, mirror like would there be any treatment to improve that luster or would they be? So in the white pearls, um, you can always assume, I would always assume that the pearls have been bleached. They're always going to be bleached. And um, I would also assume they have gone through some sort of my shorty treatment, whether it's a chemical treatment, whether it's a, uh, a, a luster treatment, white pearls universally, unless you are pulling them out of the shell, you have to assume they have gone through that um, because you don't buy freshwater pearls from a farm, you buy them from a processing factory. Now, that being said, it's a good question, Edward, because let me pull out the natural colored strands here. And now I'm dropping them all over the floor. I don't wanna do that. So um, let me first go into a, just a beautiful, beautiful strand that belongs to my wife. Um, I bought this strand for her because I thought it was so beautiful. And anytime I find stuff really, really beautiful, I, you know, I feel like I want to see it. So I buy it and give it to my wife. Um, but these are um, really, really, really fine, fine quality um, a Baroque beaded, but they're not rounds. So now we can get into the ones that you've talked, you just asked about, you asked about the purple one. Is this natural color? Yes, this is a natural color. This is a natural color purple strand of pearls. It's quite dark. Very. So when you get into the natural colors, now these are not treated the same way the whites are, of course, because they're not bleached. Now, in fact, when natural colors are treated, believe it or not, they're usually dyed because they take the peach and the lavender and they turn those into the dyed pearls. They don't use the white pearls uh, to, to dye black fresh water pearls. So how good can they get? Wow. Wow. I mean, if the first, they looked like uh, Anadama, uh, Akoya cultured pearls. Anadama is like a, a mythical world for the finest quality Akoyas that you might find. Those look like I fine go the vault to show you, cultured pearls. 14 and a half millimeter, half. wow. Those yeah. are huge, those are big. So, so this, is, um, this is a strand that was given to me. Well, it wasn't given to me. I got this strand from Michael Tse, the president of Hung May and the Hong Kong Pearl Association, um, just as being a creme de la creme of how good B-nucleated whites can get. So, um, you know, um, uh, Peter or Jack, if you're listening, don't freak out. This is like literally as good as it could get. There was Peter only is strategy. listening. Actually. What's that? Peter is listening. He's listening. So um, that's about as good as they can get. Now this strand, they were they were asking twenty five thousand dollars for this strand. 
at the show. Wow. Um, and you can also see them even larger. Mixed with South Seas and, and Tahitians. And you can tell just by looking uh, which ones are which, which ones are fresh waters and which ones are salt waters. Yep, absolutely. Good. And, and so part. these trends, and this is sort of new. You'll see some people doing this. It hasn't, you don't see a lot of this, but um, we've been having some fun with this just because the pearls in a way start to complement their, their, I would call them their saltwater cousins. Um, they're, they're definitely still not as valuable as the white South Seas or the Tahitians or the gold South Seas in this size. Uh, but you can see that they do start to complement the pearls and, and they complement them in terms of size and, and, and even in terms of, of quality. Uh, that, that, I, I remember uh, because you could tell um, um, a, a, few, uh, a few days ago when we were chatting uh, and you know, I, I mean, I mean, Southern Italy with uh, uh, very close to Enzo Liverino, and I was in his office when we were chatting, and he was showing me uh, an artistic dagger uh, made with cultured pearls. And only by video you could look at the dagger and tell that some were salt waters and some were actually fresh waters. Well, I've been looking at uh, pearls for twenty some years, so that that's it's, it. It gets easy after a little while. <laughs> I'm sure and that, that 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 is amazing. Uh, normally in my classes, when, when I teach and I tell for a student, it's really easy to distinguish a cubic zirconia for a diamond or even a moist, synthetic moissanite and a, and, a, and a diamond. Because if you look at them for years and years, it's really easy to, to sort it out. It's like the same of, a, of a separating, I don't know the names in English, I'm going to say this in Portuguese, to separate um, a sobreiro do mazinheira which is two trees that we have in Southern Portugal that any local, they will know exactly uh, which one is which, but we that live in the city, we have no clue. So learning how to look is key in our industry. And there are a lot of questions about this in the chat and the Q and A is, you know, how do you actually learn to differentiate between the two? And Jeremy, as I'm understanding from what you're saying, it's really just experience. You know, there are tricks to this uh, differentiating between them. Um, they tend to have a very specific look about them. The strand that I just showed you is, 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 it looks like a strand of white South Sea pearls. Unless you're really an expert, you're going to assume they're white South Sea pearls. Those are absolutely the exception, not the rule. If you work with freshwater pearls, you'll, you'll start to learn that the luster is typically slightly different. Um, the flaws will be different. Um, the, the way the pearls have been drilled is going to be slightly different. And most importantly, the shape is always going to be slightly different. Um, even with a bead nucleated pearl, the shape is typically different. But when you're with tissue nucleated, especially, the shape is not going to follow that perfect shape of a round bead. With a saltwater pearl, you're going to be slightly off. But remember, with an Akoya pearl, you might have a half a millimeter to a millimeter of nacre. So you're tightly following that shape of the pearl not always the case with, with, with freshwater pearls. So um, there are tricks to it. And I imagine if we sat down and did a webinar and even with a better camera and showed um, say 50 strands of freshwater pearls and 50 strands of saltwater pearls that were similar but different, I imagine um, anyone could get up to the point where they could pretty easily distinguish between the two. But you're right, Ed, a lot of it does come down to, to practice and experience. So um, because I, mentioned, I mentioned that dagger. I have here uh, uh, Enzo with me with, uh, with that artistic dagger. <laughs> no. can, can, uh, Enzo, can you show the dagger to the people, to our uh, audience? By the way, everyone, Enzo Liverino. And this, Enzo. Is, a, uh, this is an artistic dagger made uh, in his honor uh, out of freshwater cultured pearls and some salt water. I, I don't want to, I don't want to touch it because it's quite, quite, quite valuable and has a bull. And uh, as you can see, it has colored pearls. Some are natural colored. Some might be uh, artificially colored fresh water, right? Like those little ones over there. And uh, Enzo, who, who uh, and this, this was made for you by uh, an artist called Yanfa. It's better touch. It's a bad luck if I, if I touch it because this is yours. 
by a young father. He is a Belgium uh, uh, artist who made, uh, in, I think, my opinion, is number one in uh, contemporary art. And uh, uh, in the uh, last three years, we have worked together to make uh, amazing uh, artwork with, uh, with uh, coral. Uh, someone was in the Museo di Capo di Monte in Naples, and then uh, we donate uh, four uh, gigantic pieces to Pio Punta della Misericordia, it is a, a church in Naples where there is also a painting from uh, uh, Caravaggio. And then uh, we decide to um, make something with the pearl. This is uh, just uh, uh, an example of what we can do. And uh, in September, when it will come, we will go on, on this project, maybe some bigger things. So it's a, a way of, uh, sometimes uh, with a bad comparison, but in lower quality gemstones like quartz, uh, if you want to enhance the value, you have artistic sculptures and artistic cuts. And with freshwater cultured pearls, that, that their value is not as high as the other cultured pearls. With uh, some artistic uh, thing like uh, Jan Faber just did, you, you can possibly also do the same. Thank you very much, Enzo Liberino, for, for showing us your, your personal treasure. And uh, Edward, you were saying something? No, it's okay. Carry on. Well, hey, why don't I switch over to some souffle pearls then? I've got a few more pearls I'd like to get through here if we're really going to cover the full 20 years. So let me go back over here. So you guys have heard about the souffle pearls. Souffle pearls um, are second generation pearls. The shells were opened up and inside of the pearl sack, they put, I called it earthen material. I think Elizabeth Strack called it earthen material in an article and I thought that sounded cool. It's really just dirt. It's mud as far as I can tell. And um, so that's what these pearls are in here. They've got dirt, mud inside of them. The reason I included these little ones over here, because only to show you, not many people see these, um, those are from bee nucleated rejections in the gonad. These are supposedly Chinese caches, but of course caches don't exist in freshwater pearls, so they can't be called caches, they're just freshwater pearls. But for the process themselves, they're caches. So um, these, pearls when you cut them open you can see that's the innards of a souffle pearl and it is completely hollow on the inside of it you can see and uh my wife cut that open for us and cleaned out the inside and that's how you can tell she came up with the idea to uh, to make her jewelry is that it creates this perfect little concave pocket so these are some of the newest pearls that have only come out in the past few years, um, but they're getting harder and harder and harder to find. Um, Michael Tse, the one who um, was first promoting these pearls in, in Hong Kong, has pretty much stopped promoting them. So has Ruan's, the first growers. And so we're not really seeing them anymore. So we've collected as many as we could over the years, really just now for my wife because, because she uses them. No. Um, Edward, we st I think we still have time for one more topic or question. Have you seen anything on the chat room or at the Q&A that um, catched your attention for a last topic or a last question? Well, we, we've talked about treatments and I, I don't think we've really talked much or maybe we could talk a little bit more about different color treatments. Sure. And by the way, if you can see in my um, right now, um, I just added one tiny bead nucleated pearl. You can see it to the right of those pearls and you can see inside there these tiny beads inside a little glass ramekin. Mm -hmm. What you're seeing there, and I'll add this, is last year's newest generation of beaded pearls. Wow, fresh Most water. Most people haven't seen those. They are down as small as five millimeters, five, six, seven millimeters. It is. Um, are those that are called the mini mings? <laughs> Perhaps. Um, I don't think any of them have a scientific name yet, although that sounds like a good one, Ray. The, the mini mings. mings. The mini mings. They're like the mini me. Uh, so, 
these are actually grown at the same time as the other pearls. So say you take a, a large shell and you're growing a, a, a gonad grown pearl. Well, after two years, they can pull it out of the water and then insert these small beaded grafts into the mantle. And now these are grown in the mantle. So wow. basically what they've done is they've used the same shells that are already growing another harvest, another production, and they're using it twice at the same time now to grow these. And to me, these are a clear affront to Akoyas. That's what they're trying to accomplish. But quality is nowhere near it. Luster is not quite there. And believe it or not, the price is higher than tissue nuke right now. Wow, Jeremy, uh, I feel that I could be here for hours uh, chatting with you and, uh, and changing um, ideas on, 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 on pearls, but uh, the time has run out and we really have to, to bring this to, uh, to uh, I don't say closure, I don't know how to say it. I'm not an English native, so I'm allowed to say words that don't mean what they mean in English. So, but we, we have to finish. And uh, um, I would leave you uh, to the floor for your final remarks. Then I will pass the floor to Edward, and then I will do the wrap up and uh, of this uh, of this show. Jeremy, the floor is yours for the final remarks. Thanks, Rui. You're really putting me on the spot here. Final remarks, huh? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, my favorite thing is pearls. So my final remarks. I'm going to show you a a a pearl. Um, that uh, is really special to me. And, and it, I call it a color-changing freshwater pearl. And the reason wow. I call it a color-changing freshwater pearl is because this pearl changes colors depending on where the light it hits it and what the light actually is. And so you can see in this photo, in this uh, light box, it's, it's kind of green, it's kind of yellow, it's got some pinks. And there's also a picture of this um, on the top of the Eiffel Tower when I gave it to my wife. I was in Grace's office years ago in Hong Kong, and they dumped out this giant bag of pearls. And it was, it was early on when they had started, uh, you know, really growing tissue nukes and everything in these new hybrids and started getting these really crazy colors of pearls. And they dumped out this giant bag of pearls that they were selling by the kilo. Um, and it was probably a 50 kilo bag of pearls. And within it were maybe 10 or 15 amazing, amazing pearls that were just shifting colors. And I grabbed them and this is one of those pearls and they let me have it for $9. And I built a $3,000 ring around it and gave it to my wife. Wow, and that's, so, that's uh, really beautiful. Thanks for sharing. My closing remark is I love all types of pearls, but even though freshwater pearls do have a bad rap, there are freshwater pearls to love too. Uh, thank you very much. That's really inspiring. and. Curiously, this goes uh, uh, the, to a very old uh, the tradition, which was uh, using pearls as engagement rings. And my mother, she, uh, my, the, my mother's engagement ring has a diamond and, a, and an Akoya cultured pearl. So it's uh, interesting, uh, interesting that you have a fresh water one for your wife. And this also brings me to something that I've, I've, I've discussed with Edward earlier on today, which is, uh, our industry and uh, now people are most devoted to uh, their relationships and their human relationships and maybe the jewelry industry has something to say and an engagement ring or a relationship ring like with a nice freshwater cultured pearl may be something to celebrate uh, the new way of seeing relationships post COVID. Edward. Well you're right you know jewelry has always celebrated gift giving and human relationships. And those relationships are so much more important than they ever were before. So you're right, that's the positive future for the jewelry industry as we come out of COVID is that people want to be close to each other. We can't very much at the moment. We will be able to soon. Please take care of everybody before we can do that. But the consequence of that is that celebrating relationships and celebrating friendships and family is going to be ever more important. And jewelry is one of the most important ways to do that. My final comments, though, if I can, Rui, to everybody just quickly, we're getting some comments that some people unfortunately couldn't join the webinar when we reached the 500 limit. We did increase the Zoom room to 1,000 prior to this webinar. So we really do apologize if for some reason that did not work. 
and it was limited to 500. We tried our best to increase, to accommodate the Jeremy Shepherd fan club, which came in their hundreds, literally, to join. Um, but we apologize if, this didn't, if that didn't quite work out. Jeremy, thanks for a great session as always. Rui, you're gonna have to drink more soda to make yourself even better than those beautiful pearls. But thanks a lot for the day, it's been cool. This is my favorite picture of you, Rui. If you're, oh, if you're Jeremy, that, it, that's me. You know, before, it, the reason the this is my favorite picture of you, Rui, is because you're smiling so much. That's the only reason. I love this picture of you. Oh, it's great. It was in Bangkok with Jeremy and also with my good friend, the Fijian crazy guy. Uh, it's, it's really cool to have this picture showing that I'm actually only 1 meter 65 next to two <laughs> big, big, big guys. So thank you very much, everyone, and thank you especially to you, Jeremy. And I'm sorry to realize that we did increase uh, the room capacity to 1,000, and we did it before the webinar, so it's tr strange that it didn't work out. I'm, I'm really sorry, and I will sort it out later on. Um, but I'm sure that many people went because uh, Jeremy opened up his fan club to me and Edward, and I say, wow, he is Rui's friend, so let's see Rui and let's see Edward, I'm sure. And by the way, I, I, I asked you this question, Jeremy, before um, we started the hard webinar, which or who was the, your preferred one, Edward in, or myself? Yeah. Wow. I, I'm just gonna wow, mute wow, his wow. microphone. I'm just gonna <laughs> mute Jeremy's microphone, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. You you you, you can. Uh, uh, I hope you guys can both take that answer and not be offended. So you're welcome. <laughs> I, I don't want to do a Jimmy Kimmel and the other guys thing on that goes on on TV for so so long. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for having waken up so early to offer your expertise to our audience. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Sibjo, for the support. Of course, thank you, Edward, for being there and supporting these home gemology webinars and making sure everything is okay, especially when uh, broadcasting on time, it, it, it's actually brilliant. And um, thank you that uh, spend an hour and a few minutes with us this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, or this tomorrow, or this yesterday, just to learn a little bit more about, about pearls, about cultured pearls, and uh, about beautiful things in our jewelry industry. Thank you very much. I have a nice, uh, warm summer. We will be back in September. And um, if, you, if you subscribe the newsletter, you will get... Uh, oh, this, when I do the sales speech, I, I just... Blah, 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 blah. It's not for me, actually. And you will... Uh, you will um, I think Edward is... Uh, okay, now I'm, I'm, now I'm on video. It was Edward on video, now I'm on video. So <laughs> thank you very much for being there. And... Uh, you sign up for the newsletter and you will have all the updates that you need to follow our webinars. Thank you, Jeremy, once more time. Thank you, Edward. Bye-bye. Take care. Have a great summer. Bye, everybody. Take bye -bye. care.